So why don't we do this? Why don't we go, go before him one more time and let's ask the, the Holy Spirit today to teach us out of his word, the word of God, what he wants for our hearts today. So Father, we come to you today and Lord, we ask that as we look into your word, Father, if we look into your holy scriptures, God, that you would speak to us life out of them, Lord, that you would speak to us right where we're at in the seasons of our lives. God, what you would have us to do so that when we come into this place, Lord, that we would come knowing that we come to be equipped, to be empowered, to be educated and filled, that when we walk out of this house, Lord, that we walk out into the world to shine your light, Lord, to be a reflection of your goodness to this place. And so, Father, as we get into your word, I pray tonight that it's not me, Lord, it's not some words of a man, but, Lord, I pray tonight that it's the word of the Holy Spirit that speaks to each and every one of us through the inspiration of, his Holy, of your holy word. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, amen. amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to go to the book of Acts chapter 1 today. Now, if you... Uh, we're with me on Wednesday. If you weren't, it's no, no big deal because we're not, we're not in a series or anything like that. But I, I'd set a statement of something that I like to do. I, sometimes I try to study the Word of God uh, seasonally in the sense of whatever is going on in that season. I like to stay in that. And this being the week after Easter, I don't want to kind of just get, in, get through Easter and then kind of like move on and think about the next thing. So I like to take these next couple of weeks in my life and just kind of meditate and study and just think about all the different things that happen from the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the ascension of Jesus. And so as I was reading, these are just some things in my own personal time that I think that God was speaking to me. And I shared one of those on Wednesday night, and I'm going to share one tonight uh, about what God is speaking to me in his word and just some things that we can look at in our lives. And if you're taking notes or to refer it later on, I'd title the message, Can I Get a Witness? Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? All right. So we're going to talk about that. Before we get into the scriptures tonight, I want to just take you with me to probably my favorite time in the history of the world. And that is right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, there was a time. I mean, think about it for a moment. If, if you've got thinking caps or if you've got an imagination cap, and put that on for a moment and just, just try to go there with me because this is... It's such a unique, it's such an amazing time. You think about a world that didn't have any electricity, no lights, no sound, no internet. How would we get by with the internet? No cell phones, no phones, no newspapers. Books weren't even yet invented. If you wanted to read, you read on papers or scrolls. And if you had the money, you were educated, but most people weren't even educated. It's a season in which there was a a great empire called the Roman Empire. The greatest empire that the world had ever seen at that time, and really even until this time. That the greatest expanse of power from all the way to the northern parts of Europe, through Africa to the southern parts, all the way to the stretches of India in those areas, the Roman Empire. And here's this little tiny group of people. Started out with about 120 people. And these 120 people had an experience with God and an encounter with God. And, and they went to the streets and they told the world about this encounter with God. And in one day, thousands of people came to know Jesus. And that group of 120 grew to thousands. And from that moment, the word began to spread like a wildfire, north to south, to the east, to the west. And within a couple of decades, I mean, think about it, news didn't travel like it travels today. You know, uh, there's groups on Facebook for our local communities, and you can see if somebody rang a doorbell and they were suspicious, people post a picture of them and say, like, watch out. The news travels instantly today, but news didn't travel fast in this time. And the news was spreading in all directions of this, this man, Jesus, who died on a cross and who rose from the dead and who came to bring life to those who would believe in him. And it's so amazing to me as I think about it, and I think about the history of the church, the first church, this dedicated group of, of believers. I mean, think about it for a moment. They didn't have this yet. This is what we call the Bible. For most of what we read, the New Testament wasn't even written or penned down. At this time, it was just word of mouth and as the letters were being written to, to the different churches like Ephesus and the churches at Philippi, the church at Corinth that we would later call these books as Ephesians and Philippians and Corinthians, as the, the followers of Jesus and the disciples of Jesus would write or dictate 
their experiences to their writers and they would pen their stories down that we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. As these things began to happen, it, it wouldn't even be for several hundred more years that they were collected together to be formed into what you and I call the Bible. And you think about it for a moment. Without a Bible, without news, without social media, without internet, without television, without cars and trains and planes, without the, the modern comforts of life that we have today, the world was literally transformed. That in the period of 300 years, these 120 original people were well into the millions to the point where they overtook the greatest empire the world had ever seen. They started the greatest revolution that the world had ever known and the revolution that they started is still going today. But you think about revolutions. Never once did they pick up a sword in their revolution. Never once did they march in the streets against something in their revolution. But rather they met in homes and they broke bread together and they went out into the marketplaces of the street and they communicated with each other. And in their lives, within a period of 300 years, they became the greatest faith on the face of the earth. Without so much as what you and I would consider to be standard in today's life. And the question I ask as I look at this period, when their children would be ripped out of homes for their faith and fed to wild animals as, per, as persecution, when letters, documented letters of Roman governors writing to Caesars of Rome would say and ask the question, I don't know what to do with these so-called Christians. What should we do with them? If they're Roman citizens, I send them to Rome for trial. If they're not Roman citizens, I've just been killing them because they're so resolved that they must be guilty of something. That's a Roman governor, Plinius, writing to Caesar about what to do with Christians. Yet in despite of all of that, the church flourished. The church grew. The church expanded exponentially. We think of today in our days, if you've been to church for any amount of time, we think about this term revival. That we long to see God's revival in the land. But this was the greatest revival the world had ever seen. Why? Because in the period of several years, the church literally changed the world. And as I look back at that season, I ask, man, how? How did they do it? What did they, what did they have that we don't have? What is, why does it not look like that today? The Christian faith is growing, but it's not the fastest growing faith right now. There's other faiths that are growing faster. Why is it that it's happening like this? And I just asked myself, and as I did, I was studying the scriptures and Things that happened after the resurrection of Jesus, and this celebrates one week of the resurrection of Jesus as we celebrate Easter. And I was reading the book of Acts. And I think the book of Acts gives us light to how they did what they did, to why they did what they did. And as we think about this idea of can I get a witness, these are the last words of Jesus to his disciples as you can see some of them also recorded in the book of Matthew and the finishing statements of Luke as well. And here in the book of Acts, this is the, the final statement of Jesus, probably about 39 days after his resurrection, 40 days after his resurrection. And he ascends to, to heaven after these words. And in Acts, the first chapter, they ask him, Lord, are you returning and going to restore the nation of Israel? And Jesus says, that's not for you to know the time in which I return. But then he leaves them with his final statement on earth. He says these words to them in Acts, the first chapter, verse number eight. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and into the end of the earth. And the, the, birth, the verse tells us in verse number 9 that Jesus ascended into heaven. As they were looking into heaven, the angel said, Why do you look into the heavens? He's not here anymore. Go do your thing. 
And the disciples went to Jerusalem, as he told them, to wait into what they call the upper room. It was a room that, you think of it like this, it was a banquet hall that they rented because it had to be pretty big to fit 120 people in it, right? Banquet hall that they had rented or they had leased for the, the celebrations of the time. And they waited in that room for 10 days. And after that, on the 10th day, the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, we celebrate the birthday of the church. The birthday of the church. And I think what's so amazing is that Jesus says these words to his disciples. He says, you will be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, where they were, in Judea, the region, Samaria, the foreign lands, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, as the King James says, or to the far reaches of the world. He says, Jesus, I like to think of it like this. Jesus tells his disciples in the last moments, guys, we're going global. And you're going to be the vessels in which we're taking this global. And right then, something happens. Something happens. And I wanted to talk about this idea of being a witness. Because a witness is someone who has seen or experienced something in life. It's someone who can testify or, or validate something that has gone on in life. And Jesus says, you're going to be witnesses to me. I mean, you think about it like this. The term witness, the idea of a witness, is so important in our modern day legal system. That a witness can make or break a case. Why? Because anybody can fabricate a story. Anybody can come and say they saw something or they experienced something. But if there's a witness there, if somebody is there to validate the story, to say, no, I saw it, I was a part of it, I experienced it, now all of a sudden, that's not just a fabrication, but rather now there's some validity to it. And Jesus tells his disciples, we're going global with this message, that the world is going to be changed, and you are the witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in your hometown, in Judea, in the region, in Samaria, the closest areas around, and to the uttermost parts of the world, you are going to go global with this message. And you will be witnesses to validate, to show when people look at you, they'll see me. And they went. They went, Philip went to Samaria. And he witnessed in Samaria. And, and, and Peter and John come back a couple of, of days later. And there's a church established in Samaria. And, and they go to Antioch in the north of Israel. And there they start to witness and start to speak the word of God. And there's a church that blossoms there of hundreds of thousands of people. And they go to Ephesus. And Paul goes to Europe. And he meets this lady named Lydia who's the seller of purple. What does that mean? I don't know. But she sold purple. She had a market on the color. And he talks to this lady and she gives her heart to Jesus. And Lydia is the first known convert on the continent of Europe. The message went global because they were witnesses. They were there to share. They were there to tell of their experience. They were there to testify. You think of a legal case, a witness, they come and they testify to what they say. That's why in Christian, in Christianity, sometimes we have churchy words. And if, you, if you've not been around the church a long time, it's to hang around, you'll hear churchy words. And you're like, what does that churchy word mean? One of those churchy words is testimony. You know, it's, it's, it's share your testimony. That's a testament, testifying to what God has done. And I think of this idea of witnesses, and Jesus says this particular statement. He says, you'll be witnesses to me. You'll be witnesses to me, not for me, but to me. Because I think of it like this. The sum of our lives, witnesses to the source of our lives. What does that mean? The sum of our lives witnesses the source of our lives. Everything you and I do with our lives will be a witness to the source of what we do or why we do our lives. So what is on the inside of you and I? What it is that gets us out of bed in the morning. What it is that drives us to do whatever we do. Our actions in life will be a witness to what it is on the inside of us that drives us. The sum of your life, the total story, the whole package from beginning to end will be a witness to the source of your life. But the worst thing is, when somebody says something and then they do something different. You ever been around somebody that does that? 
They witness to something, but then they're totally off the mark on that. I remember a couple of years ago when my parents lived in another house, they, they wanted to have this project done. And they found this ad in a magazine. You know those magazines that the, sometimes the cities, they, they have their own publications like the Highland or Your Villa, or Redlands, and they have like their own little advertisement publication. It's all about the different doctors and contractors. And they saw an ad in the newspaper in this magazine of the service that they wanted to have done in their house, some contracting, some building, some, some kind of customization. And they, they called this guy out, and I remember I was there because it had to do with audiovisual stuff, and they interviewed this guy, this contractor, and he, and he said, oh, man, I've done all the great houses in Redlands, and, and I've done this work, and I've done that work, and I've been doing my job for X amount of years, and he just, he, he just sold himself like you he, like he couldn't imagine. I mean, this guy was God's gift to creation, you know, and creative uh, uh, technology and things of that nature. But what's so amazing is that the sum of his life, or you could say it like this, the sum of his work was a witness to the source of his work. Because as he began to work, as he began to put his hands to the trade in which he claimed to be a part of and to which he claimed to be a master at, it was abundantly evident that he had no clue what he was doing. I mean, the, the quality of the job, the, the workmanship behind it, the time in which uh, it took to do it. As a matter of fact, uh, I think he even like got hurt doing it because he did it wrong in the first place. And then he blamed mom and dad for him getting hurt because he didn't know how to do what he said he was a master at doing. Sometimes that happens to us in life. Maybe you've been around somebody where they said they were something. When they said they lived for something, when they stood, said they stood for something, when they said they existed for a reason, but as you watch their actions, as you watch their life, as you watch what goes on about them, the sum of their life, not just the words of their life, but the sum of their life doesn't quite back up what they say or claim to be. Because ultimately, Jesus said it like this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you lay up treasures in your heart, you'll seek after those treasures in your life. And Jesus tells his disciples, you will be witnesses to me, which means that the source of their life had to be greater than just to, to make their names known, to, to stand for a simple cause, because there's a lot of causes in the world today, but there had to be something greater behind them, that they were a witness to what God wanted for their lives. Jesus said, witnesses to me, not just for me. You see, in the legal system, a first-hand witness carries more weight than a second-hand witness. Anybody ever played the game telephone? You ever tried that before? It's a fun social experiment where you tell somebody secretly in their ear and then they tell the person next to them what you told them and, the, and then it passes down the line through a group of people and then you ask the last person in the line, what did I say? And they say what they said and it's not even remotely close to what you said because in the process of telling what was said, somebody always changes something about that. A first-hand witness carries more weight than a second-hand witness. Why? Because a first-hand witness are what we are generally call an eyewitness. They saw it. They experienced it. A second-hand witness is, well, the eyewitness was my mom, and she told me she saw. And then it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. But you see, God didn't call us to be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Let's see, we're in the 19th century, so we could be the 19th hand or no, we're in the 21st century. The 21st hand witness. 19th century, man, we'd be in the 1800s if we were in the 19th century. It's always confusing. God didn't call you to be the 21st hand witness. He called you to be the first hand witness. The eyewitness of what God is doing. You see, as Jesus spoke this word to his disciples, I believe Jesus now today through the living, breathing word of God speaks this word into you and into me. That the sum of our lives will be a witness to the source of our lives. And if Jesus Christ is the source of our lives, then the sum of our lives will be a witness to what Jesus does in our lives. So often we think within Christianity that we need to witness. Let's go out on the street and witness to somebody today. And so often what we think about witnessing is, is going and telling somebody what God did in our lives. 
But you know the interesting thing about the legal system and thinking about witnesses are? The longer time progresses, the less influence that witness's testimony has. That's why in the legal system, there's something called, you may not have known this, but there's something called statute of limitations, which means in many cases, in many areas, there's only a certain amount of time somebody can enter a legal proceeding for. Why? Because the testimony of the witness and the proof or the evidence of what happened begins to lose its influence as time progresses. So if we think that to witness for Jesus is to go and tell somebody what God did in our lives, guess what we're missing out on? Relevance. Because a testimony is not something that God did to you. A testimony is something that God does to you. Because you see, the sum of your life, think about this, not just momentary section of your life. God didn't just come for a moment and change your life and then everything else happened and your life just progressed. No. The sum of our lives through Jesus Christ from beginning to end is the, 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 the witness of the source, the source of our lives, meaning God's continual interaction in our lives. But when we think about a testimony being something that God did in my life, maybe two years ago, three years ago, two months ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, twenty-five years ago, guess what happens? We lose relevance to somebody today. Because the world is not interested in what happened 10 years ago, two years ago, three weeks ago. Do you remember the very first time we saw a terrorist attack in America? Well, not the very first time, but the biggest one, right? September 11, 2001. Everybody knew where they were on September 11. And then there was others. And then there was others. And then there was others. And just a year ago, and a year and four months ago, five months ago, there was one in our own hometown, San Bernardino. But have you noticed that we've become desensitized to the frequency of the different terror attacks and the different shootings and the different, the different problems that we see? Why? Because as time goes by, we lose our relevance. So we need to understand as Christians that we don't go to witness. We are witnesses. You don't go to witness. No, you can go out in the street and witness to somebody. That's great. But to understand that you don't just go to witness, but rather you and I, as believers of Jesus Christ, are witnesses. In our words, in our deeds, in our actions, in our lives, when people are watching. And guess what? When people aren't watching, we are witnesses to Jesus Christ. Why? Because the sum, the whole capacity of our life from beginning to end, from the moment, if you found Jesus, the moment you found Jesus, some of you that might be tonight, that might have been 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago, till the end of your life, the sum of your life will witness to the source of your life. But if the source of your life isn't Jesus, then guess what the sum of your life will witness to? What the source really is. And thus, we find ourselves in the pickle we're in today. When we look back at the great season of history and we see the church growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and then we find ourselves today wondering, God, why don't you move like you moved then? Why not today? And God says, because the source of your life is not Jesus. That's deep. But you think about it like this. That statement of witnesses is predicated, built upon another statement in Acts, the first chapter. Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. You see, if the sum of our lives is a witness to the source of our lives. If the source of our life is the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I won't have to worry about going out 
to witness. Why? Because you and I will shine the brightness of the glory of God and we won't just go to witnesses, but we will be witnesses to God. Witnesses in our neighborhoods, witnesses on our job, witnesses in our family, witnesses to the people that we sit next to in church that need to know Jesus. Believe it or not, there's people in church that still need to know Jesus. And Jesus says this, here's the key to success. You want to know how the church changed the world? Jesus said, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. They were hiding in the upper room for the fear of the Jews. And then all of a sudden something happened. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they said, why are we hiding? Let's go out into the street and do what? Be a witness. When the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, you won't have to worry about witnessing because you will be a witness. We sang it today. Let your light shine in us. Jesus in his great sermon on the mount in Matthew the fifth chapter and Luke the sixth chapter. Jesus says about you and he says about me and he says about all followers of himself. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city upon a hill that cannot be hidden, you and I, with the power of Jesus on the inside of us, with his Holy Spirit, are the light of the world. And he goes on and he says this in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse number 16. And he says, so let your light shine brightly before men. Why? So that when they see your good works, they would glorify your Father in heaven. You see, Jesus said you'd be witnesses to him. Which means when people see you, your life, the sum of your life is a witness to the source. Which means people see you. They don't see you any longer. But rather they see the source. Which is the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you with the power of God. I love that word power. That word power is dunamis, right? We we translated that word several hundred years later when scientists found out how to compress uh, chemicals into a stick and light it on fire and blow it up. They called it dynamite. It's the same idea. Jesus says you will receive power. The source of life that will be on the inside of you. And that when you shine, people will look at you and they will not see you. They will see God in heaven. And your life will be a witness to God. Can I get a witness? So Jesus says, we're like light bulbs. You know, I think about it. I brought a light bulb. Jesus says, you're like a light bulb. You see, you were created for a purpose. That purpose the light bulb was created for is to shine. It has no other purpose. Maybe you use it to hold a book down, or I I can't imagine what else we would use light bulbs for. But maybe you have light bulbs stored. But you know the amazing thing is, is that just because this light bulb was created to shine doesn't mean it's going to shine. You see, you and I, were like a light bulb. Just because you were created to shine the light of God, God said, let us make man in our image. That when humanity sees humanity, they see the image of God. And that the very purpose and reason for our existence is to bring glory to God in our lives. But just because we have an intended purpose in life does not mean you and I will ever fulfill that intended purpose. Why? Because like a light bulb, It doesn't create light because it's a light bulb. No. A light bulb creates light when it's connected to the source of power. And that's you and me. You see, we have an intended purpose, Jesus says, to shine, to shine brightly. That the world would see, that the world would not see you, that they wouldn't see your philanthropic efforts, 
but rather that they would see what you do in your life, that the sum of your life would be a witness to the source of your life, and that when you are connected to the source of power, the power of the Holy Spirit of God, that when you are tapped into the power of God, you will fulfill the very purpose for which you were created. And then when you fulfill the very purpose for which you were created, guess what happens? The body of Christ grows. Why? Because it's God's intended plan for you and I to shine like lights upon a hill, cities that cannot be hidden. But if we choose to not be connected to the source of power, it's a social club. It's a gathering of people to hear a band or to be entertained by a preacher as he pours his heart out with sweat and veins. But when we allow that source to be the Holy Spirit of God that flows in us and through us, now all of a sudden, like a light bulb, we fulfill the created purpose of our existence in life. I'm going to turn that light off because I know the people in the video room are like, please turn it off. You will receive power. Don't disconnect from it. Don't disconnect from it. Stay connected to the source. How did the world change without ever lifting a sword? Without ever creating a revolution in the streets? Without ever boycotting or fighting? Without ever resisting, but rather just existing? How did the world change? Because they stayed connected to the source. But you see, unlike a light bulb, you and I aren't an innate object. A light bulb has no choice whether or not it stays connected to the source. We choose with the light bulb to screw it in or unscrew it, to turn the source on or to turn it off. But you see, you and I, we're living, breathing human beings with a free will choice and the decisions that we make every day. And every day we wake up, we make the decisions. Do I want to stay connected to the source of power of God within me? Or do I want to get connected to what I want in life? And we find ourselves in that position of saying one thing, but yet doing something completely different. Paul the Apostle addresses this to the church at Galatia. In the book of, or the letter of Galatians. In the fifth chapter, Paul has this great discourse on living right with God. In the fifth chapter, verse number 15, he says, or 16, he says, I say, walk in the Spirit. You remember Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will have power. Think of it like this. Paul the Apostle says, I say, walk in the power of God and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And verse number 17 comes along and he says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these things are contrary to one another. So that you, listen to this, look at this. So that you do not do the things you wish. Intended purpose. I think every one of us, myself included, all myself included more so than I ever wish I could say, never intend to disobey God. I don't wake up in the morning and say, man, today I really feel like sinning. God, I just feel like being a miscreant. And you know what? I'll just be a, I'll be a savior. I'll be a saint the next day. But today is my cheat day for, for, against Jesus. I don't think anybody wakes up doing that. But at the same time, we've lived through these areas of our lives where each and every one of us have been exactly what we don't want to be. And that's somebody who says we're something but acts like we're not. I remember one time, you want to hear, I'll give you a confession so you can feel really good about it. I remember one time I preached about witnessing to, to our neighbors and, and to share your faith. And I got home and it was on a Sunday morning and my neighbors go to church. And I got home and right as I was getting home, there was those guys on bicycles and ties. You know what I'm talking about? 
And as I was pulling into the driveway, they were waving at me in the driveway, walking to my door. And my neighbors had just heard me talking about sharing my faith. And so they were like, oh, man, I can't wait for Pastor Lou. He's going to come. He's going to tell. And he's going to get them saved. And, 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 and so I pull in, and I see the guys, and I wave to the guys, and I pull right into my garage. And I shut the garage door behind me before I ever got out of the car. And my neighbor came up to me like the next day was like, we were all sitting out there waiting. And the moment you shut the garage, we were like, oh, come on. (laughs) We've all been there. We've all been there. But you know the thing that I found in life, and maybe maybe I'll drop some massive revelation on your life right now. You know the thing that I've discovered in my own life is that I've never sinned while walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. When I'm in tune with God, I don't want to sin. The things that would tempt me, I say, why would I want to do that? It's the times in which I willingly choose to disconnect myself from the source of power to allow the things of this world to begin to influence me once again that I find myself in the areas, like Paul the Apostle says, doing the things I don't want to do. And so simply, how did the church change the world in a matter of a short time? Because Jesus said, I'm leaving you, but I'm not leaving you empty-handed. I'm leaving you with a source of power. A source of power to fight the spiritual fight. A source of power to be bold and zealous for me. A source of power to go out into the highways and the byways of life and not have to worry about whom to witness to, but rather to be an illuminating witness to Jesus. But the question is for you and I, will we, as his church today, as his followers today, will we choose every day of our lives to stay connected to the source of power in the Holy Spirit? Or will we continue to do what we do today to be ineffective at witnessing to God. Because the question's not, God, why don't you do something? God says, you've got my spirit. You've got everything you need to change this world. World hunger? No problem. Real estate problems? Homelessness? No problem. Depression? Mental health? No problem. If we, the followers of Jesus, would make the conscious choice in our lives to do what the church that first started it all made the same choice, to stay connected to the source of power. We have this beautiful thing called the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, Jesus Christ, on the inside of us that testifies to us the stories of God that what God is doing, what God will do, what God has done, and what God is going to do in the future, that you and I have the privilege today to walk every day of our lives in that presence, connected to that power. See, Paul the Apostle says to walk in the Spirit. You know what walk in the Spirit implies? Continuity. Continuity, meaning continual walking. You don't walk by taking one step and then you're done. That's not walking. That's called taking a step. He didn't say take a step in the Holy Spirit. He said walk in the Spirit. One foot in front of the next, in front of the next, in front of the next, in front of the next. Over and over again. Why? Because the sum of your life and my life will be the witness to the source of our lives. And if we choose to stay connected to the source of power, it is only by the nature of God that we will be witnesses to Jesus like the church was that we don't have to focus on being witnesses. All we have to do is focus on God and let God shine his light on the inside of us that when people see you and when people see me, they don't see you, they don't see me. They see God and the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the salvation power of Jesus that desires for this world to see the light of God. You are God's plan for redemption today. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the plan. Now you are the vessel in which the plan gets out. The question is, 
Will we stay connected to the source, the Holy Spirit? I love what Jesus does. He says, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And they waited in that room. Can you imagine 10 days of no air conditioning in the summer months? I mean, the weather's like ours. So imagine that right now, 90 degree days. No air conditioning, 120 people in a room for 10 days. There probably was more than 120 people. They just couldn't bear the stench of it after that. And all of a sudden on day 10, the day of Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit falls within them. And their lives are forever changed. And the world is forever changed. And you know the beautiful thing is? That you and I have that today as well. The power of the Holy Spirit with his baptism. I was reading an article from a conservative Calvinist theologian whom I greatly respect. That oftentimes, you don't, may not know what that means, but that means that when it comes to things of the Holy Spirit, it's very conservative on their thing. And when you talk about baptism with the Holy Spirit and things of that nature, generally they don't want to talk about that. But I was reading what he was saying about our movement. We call it the charismatic movement in America. This baptism with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit operating in the power of the Holy Spirit today. And he says the thing that we can learn from the charismatic movement is the emphasis of the life-giving power of Jesus in his Holy Spirit at work in us. We can agree, despite our theological somewhat differences, that when you and I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, there is no escaping life-giving power. Why? Because like a light bulb, you're intended to shine, but once you get connected to the light source or the source of power, that's only when you and I will shine question is, will we be connected to the source?